we are recording. So, uh, hey everyone, we are on Tuesday, the 2nd of March. Uh, it's about midday, not too much going on in the markets really. Um, we have Eddie Donmez on and we are going to have a chat about a couple of things really this all instigated by uh, uh, questions in the room this morning about the ARC ETFs and then Eddie's uh, thankfully jumped on and uh, we then very quickly got into talking about the rotations between green energy and you know oil producers and yeah I mean Eddie the floor is yours yeah so with Talking EV and ARC, and ARC's obviously uh, been the dream over the last kind of year or so. It's attracted billions in in new flows. Kathy Wood kind of couldn't do any wrong, uh, I think, as far as the market was concerned. I think fueled by tons of factors, right? I think discount rates being at zero, interest rates being at zero, the emergence of retail kind of... Uh, involvement in markets, gamification of retail, and then Elon Musk, all these kind of uh, the sen- the mood music and the sentiment was really everything go- going for Kathy Wood, right? She, you know, she sold some pretty uh, interesting stories, you know, with genomics and, uh, you know, electric vehicles and these huge addressable markets. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of her. I, I, I really... Uh, like her thinking she's very transparent both with her ETFs but also her kind of like open source research so she you know she speaks on tons of podcasts about you know all her research analysts that are uh, industry experts you know they're they're all over Twitter being challenged by professors and you know industry you know industry experts uh, on their research and all their research is published um, you know publicly uh, even their their models and things like that. So, you know, you've got to admire her kind of, I guess, Ray Dalio's radical transparency and the transparency of what she's doing. You know, she p- uh, publishes all of her trades uh, daily, all of the the Arc uh, holdings. So that's Arc K, Arc G. You know, all those different ETFs. You know, she mm. publishes all of those every day. Um, but as we saw very recently with yields rising. Um, you know, Piers and I have spoken about this and uh, Anthony and Piers have spoken about this, but uh, if you want to check out a video of why yields rising is bad for stocks, just check out the Amplify live video. Also talked about different forms of valuation and you know how, how that affects kind of stocks. But in short, more speculative cash flows for in the future, lots of uncertainty. For example, we don't know what's going to go on here in, in the current day, two months from now with COVID and things like that. So basically, when companies are super speculative, they're betting on cash flows or being profitable in 2025, 2030, 2040. And, you know, the world's uncertain. Inflation can happen. COVID can happen. Anything can happen. So those cash flows, depending on, you know, where they are in that kind of time frame, the further are they out, the more risky they are. So less um, kind of less guarantee of the valuation today and investors are paying a huge amount for future valuations. So, so something we were talking about was, you know, I mean, I, I agree completely. I think, you know, I, I showed ARC ETFs to some of my friends who work in tech and they were instantly on it, like in it, on it, wanted more. Um, and sure, you know, when's a good time to get in? Well, it depends, uh, you know, as we were talking about, it depends on your time horizon and similar to the mortgage story, you know, if you're in a 30 year contract, what do you care what the underlying asset market does in five years time, 10 years time? Um, you don't really, and these things are cyclical, but if you're, you know, if you're buying these things on margin, um, you, that can essentially go to zero on you and, and go negative on your, on your balance. Well, then, that's a different story, but if you're buying these things outright, um, you're going to be you're going to be doing fine over the term. But um, I mean, I suppose some questions. I mean, just to play devil's advocate to probably both of us here. But I mean, you know, these are there's a lot of cool stocks in there. There's a lot of like really sort of um, you know millennial type of attractiveness to it. You know, but is there value right now? 
is their value. Yeah, so I, look, they're great, sexy stories, basically. Um, and there's going to be, you know, the uh, lots of cynics, right, that, you know, have seen Kathy were doing being extremely successful and kind of selling the dream, just like we see kind of late stage SPACs and things like that, you know, it's very difficult to, to determine who's going to be super valuable, right? You know, if you're looking at all the holdings, are all the holdings going to be, you know, the the Googles and Facebooks and Amazons of the world? Probably not, right? But that's survivorship. That's going to, you know, she's going to pick her winners and pick her losers as kind of time comes on. But the market will pick the winners and losers as well as that. Um, so it's, it's difficult to determine. But I think what's great about her is she she's so transparent and she 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 makes lots of assumptions and if this happens if x happens if y happens if it's policy if it's markets if it's monetary fiscal company execution then this is going to be achieved and she was she was dead right with tesla and you know will she have another call like this again who knows could could be no right um i think there was a lot of uh does she, does she need to have another yeah call like this again is the question you know Exactly. So she attracted so many flows into uh, ETFs and Tesla was a huge winner of that. Um, but from the cynical perspective uh, and what we saw when yields rose very recently is we saw these kind of these funds, the, the favorites tank pretty much. They, they were they were there was huge short interest, lots of, you know, selling volumes um and this is to do with essentially uh the liquidity of the etfs right so when something stinks, yeah exactly but this is like uh, uh, and this is what kathy was is saying and this is what she did in march was she loves these opportunities and you know she, this is her talking a book of course but she sells the googles and amazons and you know those large cap names she basically views them as cash so she just puts it in, you know, that they'll trade sideways or up you know, a couple of percent. But she sells those names on these dips to buy those small cap names. You know, and that's yeah. So she buys the gene editing, she buys the autonomous taxi, she she buys the teledocs and all of those names. Well, they have a lot of growth and, and uh, upside potential, whereas you know, we're facing into 10 years here where, you know, all these Googles and top tier blue chip techs are just going to go sideways. I mean, I think Apple is going to continue to innovate out of its skin as it tends to do. But, you know, the, the, the rest of them, I think, are facing a lot of headwinds with, you know, policy changes in, the, in Eurozone, um, you know, antitrust committees in the US. So if you're in social, it's not going to be such a smooth next 10 years for you. Yeah, I mean, we could do a whole nother you know, <laughs> recording of uh, hours about all of those names. But I think it's really interesting how she views them as cash, basically. Uh, yeah. And they're her, her treasuries almost. And then she sells those to enter opportunistic dips in the more speculative names. But I do want to kind of get to what happened really last week, why they sold off so dramatically. We talked about the cash flows and things like that, but Let's get into it, yeah. the, the concern from participants, and this is can get really kind of quite technical. So I'll try and keep it as high level as possible just for, for all of us. But the concern is with these big ETFs, right? 43%, according uh, to some, some re researchers, ARK's total equity holdings are in stocks in which the firm owns at least 10% of all shares outstanding, right? So that's a huge amount of ownership in very small companies, basically, with, with very low liquidity, if we're talking about kind of overall volumes of some of the Teslas and things like that. So as Tim, you'll know more than anyone, liquidity is always there when you don't need it and not there when you do need it. Right. So during these downturns where the market sells off or, you know, the speculative names unravel, all these different types of things, these less, less liquid stocks get hit disproportionately to the rest of the market because the, the float is, is smaller. Right. Yeah. Same. It's very similar to what we saw with kind the of books are, the books are a little thinner, which actually is quite it's basically like your, your spread can, can be huge because that you might liquidity wise, you might have a huge gap between where the volumes are on the on essentially on the ladder. So if it takes out one level, it's going to just 
drop a huge amount to meet volume at the next level down. So yeah, thin markets can be vicious. Yeah, and especially with those those low volume ones, is like you said, you know, that it can drop dramatically, and then you 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 need to find the bid somewhere. But who yeah. knows where that that market? And it, it doesn't necessarily. It, I think when you're observing that happening, it can give the impression that the move and the fundamental shift that a, a much bigger fundamental shift is at play when actually it's just a lot of gapping around and finding volume and price discovery and things like that. So yeah, so this is, so what happened last week was because these, you know, it's very transparent, right? What, um, similar to USO, right? They knew, investors knew in April when the oil price went negative, and you can talk a bit more about this later, that, you know, they were, they were buying the, they knew the contracts that the, the fund was buying, right? And so when the oil price tanked, they could almost front run that trade on, on USO. But what we saw was we saw a huge amount of redemptions from the ETFs, so outflows basically from, from the ARC ETFs, where, you know, fund managers, you know, obviously it's been up, gone up 100% or 39% annually for the last, since its since inception in 2014. Um, and yield spiked and they kind of, you know, ran to the doors and pulled all of a lot of flows from that ETF. And when there's kind of redemptions, then this is where the problem is, is when there's a discount to the NAV, the net asset value of the underlying stocks, and they're super illiquid, and it's very obvious what they own, right, then there's going to be redemptions there. And then that's going to exacerbate the moves, particularly in those kind of mm -hmm. lower volume stocks. So um, to, to really try and keep it boiled down, simplicity, it's kind of like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy domino effect that can kind of eat, self eat itself similar if you a good example is Val Magetten and the portfolio insurance but from February 2018 I'll post that link in the room later yeah I, I do you want to um talk about USO uh, and how that kind of is kind of similar to what we saw with you know when the oil price tanked um I've yeah I mean so USO essentially was more is more uh, the NAV as in the net asset value of USO is more constituted on the front month futures on uh, M123 months one, two and three in front of cash. So the spot market is the price right now to exchange that. Then you have the front month, which is 30 days forward delivery from today, theoretically, and then 60 days and 90 days. And so USO was pretty, pretty much, well, is always pretty much very heavy on months one and two in the front. And they would represent uh, at, at points about 23% of the global futures on NYMEX um, in WTI. And so essentially, um, they, that's what their net asset value is. And so when you had oil going below zero, you had people saying, oh, well, hold on a sec, USO is trading at like, at like 20 and oil is now printing at minus 30. Uh, I don't think I want to own this anymore. And so you have people exiting the USO ETF um, and, and therefore you have USO selling then because it, it, you have people exiting the ETF, then it also means that USO are essentially then selling futures contracts in months one and two and three in front. So what you get is, it's similar when, when, a, when an underlying asset, in this case, it's oil for USO um, or say Tesla for ARC, ARC was ARC F or ARC K, yeah. um, uh, then you get flight to the door and then the fund managers, themselves have to then execute sales in the underlying so it's like this self-eating thing and it only really stops um it only really stops until the fund managers say all right i'm done liquidating we're now holding a core position i'm not willing to let that core position go um i think that's that a that's a perfect <laughs> explanation i think what's also <laughs> interesting about that was 
everyone knew USO's position, right? And more importantly, their Absolutely. limitations. So it was the C was it the CFTC's rules on those position limits on the futures contracts. So when the market saw that opportunity, they all piled in to push the fund to those limits, right? Because they knew that that was their their position, and then that exacerbated the forces even more. Yeah, and then that's so, what sent oil. So so, so essentially, people, yeah, people, pe- yeah. Yeah, that's it. It, it. it gets a bit tricky, actually, because there was people exiting USO and then it flipped. Once oil went negative, actually, then it turned inverse to people piling in to USO, which essentially then saw USO buying a ton of June options. And of course, the the it was the or sorry it was the april contract that went negative um and so then they just were like we're not even entertaining buying may risk here because we don't know what the hell is going to happen we're going to just jump straight to june uh, for uso front month futures buying and so then you see the turn occur then people go from net selling uso uh, holdings to to being massive net buyers because it's it's at zero and what the result of that the ft had a great video up from one of their journalists um near the time but they've since offlined it i'm going to try and get them to put it back up but um she did a a very in-depth example of how uso was constituted and how they actually had to reorganize the pricing on on how their 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 uh, the uso is priced um after that happens and um, so it was very interesting stuff yeah. yeah and i think we can you know different to uso but again yeah. comparable to the the arc stuff is gamestop as well right when people so if you're short like melvin capital were in a very illiquid name and everyone knows that you're short and then then investors can just pile in and then it's a self-fulfilling prof- prophecy when then you get the short squeezes and then the gamma squeezes and then you know yeah. it really exacerbates and this is if we bring it all the way back to, to arc it says investors yanked 465 million from the arc innovation fund um according to refinitiv and if there's more redemptions then that's going to lead her to sell the liquid holdings like the Amazons, the you know whatever mm-hmm. uh, big uh, large cap tech they're they're holding, um, and then there's a there's a squeeze, and then there's a self fulfilling prophecy when that can actually affect the you know the, the wider market, so this uh, but makes, also unwind the illiquid holdings. So this makes sense as to why I saw a tweet yesterday about the Wall Street bets guys effectively going to try and target Amazon now. Because they know that Kathy Wood, if she gets pushed to the break point on some of her more tech, like Tesla, for example, let's use Tesla. If you get downside selling on Tesla, she's going to have to unwind other positions to then um, buy, buy other stuff and rebalance her funds. And so people are going to put a put a short squeeze on, on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, like, so that's that insane. At, yeah, like, I mean, look, look, we've got to draw the line points. somewhere. I think. Look, yeah, Amazon and GameStop, they're very <laughs> different, right? So when you're trying yeah. to play a do a play on GameStop, which is super liquid, they uh, couldn't be more of, different. Yeah, so yeah. you know that's yeah. a bit more wild. I, I mean, I, would I say I'd love to see that? I think that would be very impressive if they did, but that's a different story i think they're just kind of fantasizing there unlike yeah. gamestop where you can actually that you we yeah. saw because the volume's so low but yeah, but yeah that, I, right i think i think that's probably more more than we wanted to discuss but it's so interesting i think all of sure um just before we yeah i mean let's uh let's let's leave it there and then we'll, we'll go on and have our chat about um green energy and whatnot in a second but cool. um, brilliant thanks eddie cheers thanks Tim.